Hi folks, welcome back to our Bible study on Hebrews chapter 3. Let me just pray as we gather this evening. Lord, thank you for the day that we have had. Thank you for your blessings upon each and every one of us, your goodness and your provision. Lord, as we continue to meet to study your word, just be with us, guide us and direct us in our thoughts. And please just encourage us and challenge us, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. Let me read to you from Hebrews chapter 3. Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. You must warn each other every day while it is still today, so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. For if we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. Remember what it says. Today, when you hear, the, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts, as Israel did when they rebelled. And who was it who rebelled against God, even though they heard his voice? Wasn't it the people Moses led out of Egypt? And who made God angry for 40 years? Wasn't it the people who sinned, whose corpses lay in the wilderness? And to whom was God speaking when he took an oath that they would never enter his rest? Wasn't it the people who disobeyed him? So we see that because of their unbelief, they are not able to enter his rest. Amen. If you remember earlier on in Hebrews chapter 3, there was a warning to Israel uh, which came through verses Psalm 95, verses 7 to 11, all about their hardened hearts and about their ancestors and about turning away from God. And then this warning gets repeated again. It's obviously very important to the author, to the writer, to remind folks uh, about what to do and what not to do. He starts off verse 12 by saying, Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters. You know, he... He's warning them straight away, be careful. Um, it's easy to rush into things. It's easy to do things flippantly. It's easy just not to, to think about things. He's asking them to be, be careful, think this through, remember um, and get it right. He says, make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelievable, unbelieving. It, it, see, it's easy to judge others, isn't it? It's easy to look at somebody else and say, oh, I know what's going on in your life. I know where your problem lies. What about when we come to our own hearts? We don't want to see what our own hearts are doing. Uh, we don't want to judge ourselves. Uh, we, we want to try and sweep that onto the carpet. You know, it's, it's easy to look for somebody else's faults and not look for our own. Um, that's where the temptation is for us as people. Uh, and that's the challenge that we have, to be self-critical. To actually think about what's wrong with ourselves. Uh, and what we need to do or not do. So he says, make sure your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. You know, that word living in there as well, it's very important. So many times the people have, have worshipped idols and the golden calf and different other idols that they brought out of Egypt. They're not living, they're not real. They are a creation of people's handiwork. Whereas we're talking about the living gods, the God who made everything that's around us, the God who made us. That's who uh, the author is wanting the people to follow, wanting them to, to, to realise this is what's important. So he says, don't turn away from the living gods. Yes, turn away from all other gods. Turn your back on, on idols, things which are not important. But do not turn your back on the living God. You know, there's a challenge about, said before, about what's important in your life. Who do you worship? Uh, and having a discussion with somebody about this, you know, I often, I, I like the ad a number of years ago that was done, uh, which showed people who were training or retraining for jobs, something, the, 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 what, the job that they really wanted. And I talked about something was missing from your life. And in that they had a, a, a person and there was like a jigsaw piece cut out of them. And they were saying that, you know, this training is, is this missing piece of you. you know, that, that's an image of us. 
of all of us uh, before we come to God, before we trust God and have that relationship with him, the personal relationship, something is missing from our lives. And we search for it and people search for it in different ways and search for it in, in, in different places. But the thing that is missing is God. God completes us. God makes us whole. That doesn't mean to say that life is easy. Quite the contrary. Um, quite often whenever we start to follow God and we, we trust God for ourselves, life gets more difficult. Life gets harder. We become the target for Satan uh, and for evil. Uh, and, and that makes life more complicated. It's easier just to drift along and, and not do anything. But to actually take a stand, to actually recognise God and to accept God, that's harder. And that takes more out of us. But that's the piece which is missing. And it's, that's the living God who this author's turning, asking them not to turn away from. Verse 13 is really interesting how it puts it. It says, you must warn each other every day while it is still today. You know, it's, it's that sense of today is not literally a 24-hour day. It's a period of time. It's a time now, either before you die or before Christ comes back, where you still have an opportunity to follow God. You still have an opportunity to turn your back on evil and follow him. And there's, there's an emphasis put on, on, on us and the role that we play with each other. It says you must warn each other every day. Those of us who who trust God, those of us who um, have personal faith, we are told that we have a responsibility to tell others, to show others, to remind others about what's going on. It's not just a case of saying, well, I'm all right. It's up to you to sort yourself out. No, we have that responsibility. You must warn each other every day while it is still today. You know, there's a time coming when it'll be too late. There's a time coming whenever Jesus will return or your life will be taken from you uh, and you'll stand before God. And that stage is too late. You can't accept Christ then. You've got to do it before then. It says, so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. See, this, this is the thing. Satan is a deceiver. Um, right the way back in Genesis, uh, the serpent takes God's words and twists them and disease, deceives Adam and Eve. And that's how they fall. That's how sin comes into the world. And it's easy for us to get deceived by sin at any stage. It's easy to say, oh, it's only a wee sin, doesn't matter. Oh, it's only a small lie, it doesn't, doesn't matter. You're not really doing anybody any harm. How, how, will, that, how will that be a problem? You know, but it is. In God's eyes, sin is sin is sin. There's not a hierarchy of sin. There's not one sin which is worse than the other. All sin is bad. That's something which we sometimes forget. It's sometimes something which, you know, we're happy to sweep some sins onto the carpet. And yet we criticise others whenever they do things which we call sin because they're not good enough. Um... Here's a shock announcement for you. None of us are good enough. None of us live a sinless life. None of us get it right all the time. We are all sinners. What makes the difference is whether we realise that and accept God's grace or whether we simply harden our hearts or deceived by sin and turn our backs on God. And that's what this passage is all about. Verse 14 goes on. If we are faithful to the end, trusting God, just as firmly as when we first believe, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. Trust God. See that there is a future. That there is something to look forward to. Um, think of heaven. And if you want to think of heaven and hell in simple terms, heaven is where God is. Hell is where God isn't. You know, we've got all sorts of images in the Bible about heaven and hell, about a glorious place, about a place of, of fire and burning, um, a, a place of happiness, a place where there's no pain, as opposed to a place of anguish and gnashing of teeth. 
You know, you've got all these contrasts going on, but in all of them, the best contrast has to be heaven is where God is, hell is where God isn't. Do you want to be with God or not? Because that's what it boils down to. It's as simple as that. Um, it says that we will share in all that belongs to Christ. Again, you know, through Hebrews we've been looking, it talks about how whenever we follow God, whenever we have personal faith, when we're Christian, when you're born again, whatever phrase you want to use, how we get in, in, adopted into God's family. We become his sons and daughters. We become a brother or sister of Christ. And we share in what is happening. And it says that there, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. And that's true. It talks about storing up for ourselves treasures in heaven. As opposed to on earth where, you know, moth and rust, moth will eat and rust corrodes. Um, it says, where, where are you putting your, your, your stores? Is it on earth? Or is it in heaven? Put it in heaven, because then we share it together. Verse 15 says, remember what it says. And it goes back again to the psalmist, back again into Psalm 95. This time, just a shorter quote, just verses 7 to 8. Today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled. Israel had every opportunity had every um, example shown to them, had the very visible presence of God with them. I mean, when the tabernacle was erected, the cloud came down and filled the middle part of it. There was a pillar of cloud stood over the top of it, which had fire in it at night. The people could always see God. And that tabernacle was pitched in the middle of their camp. Uh, and they, the 12 tribes were, were pitched around that. You know, before that, the tent of meeting, which was, came before the tabernacle, was on the side of the camp. But when the tabernacle was erected and God's comes, presence comes to dwell in that, a part of his presence, it's right in the middle, in the centre. So that everyone's looking upon it. And yet they still turned their backs on God. They had manna and quail provided for them every day. They had rocks which gushed forth water and yet they still denied God. They saw miracles happen. They walked through the middle of the Red Sea and yet they were still blinded to who God was. Are we blinded to who God is? Are we blinded to what he can do? Well, as Christians... Quite often we are because we doubt what God can do. We doubt his sovereignty. We doubt that he is God. We, we doubt his power. We don't believe whenever we pray. Maybe we would pray things. We think it'll never get answered. God's never going to hear me. But he does. He hears everything and he knows everything. Even today we still don't grasp exactly who God is. So a dire warning comes at the end of Hebrews chapter 3, verses 16 to 19. And who was it who rebelled against God, even though they heard his voice? Wasn't it the people Moses led out of Egypt? You know, these people who are, are precious and treasured, who saw the miracles that Moses performed, and yet still turned their back and rebelled. Who made God angry for 40 years? It wasn't the people who sinned, whose corpses lay in the wilderness. That was judgment upon them. 40 years, God made them wander around that wilderness because of how they behaved, because of how their hearts were hardened so that they wouldn't see the promised land, they wouldn't enter it. Not even Moses. Moses got to see it. He didn't get to enter it says, whom, to whom was God speaking when he took an oath that they would never enter his rest? Wasn't it the people who disobeyed him? We see that because of their unbelief, they are unable to enter his rest. Yeah, they, did, they didn't get into the promised land because of their unbelief. And that's a warning which talks about heaven as well. You know, we, we talk about, you know, when you read Revelation 21, it says about 
heaven, new heaven and a new earth. And it talks about heaven, a place where there's no more sorrow, no sadness, no tears, no sickness. What a glorious place that will be. It will be magnificent in God's presence. But if we don't obey him, if we don't trust him, if we don't surrender ourselves to him, we will not enter into that place. Instead, we are judged. And what is waiting for us then in judgment is hell. You know, it's good to remind ourselves of these things. It's good to remind ourselves of these things because it reminds us of God's grace. It reminds us that we are, we are not good enough and we on our own will never be good enough. No matter who you get as the, the best person who walks this earth, they're not Jesus. So they're still going to have sin and they're still going to have um, that blemish in their life which keeps them out of heaven. But with God's grace, it takes that away. Jesus dying on the cross to forgive us our sins means that we are made right with God. Our, our relationship is restored, it is healed so that we can become adopted brothers and sisters. We can become God's children and enter into heaven. You know, the, the, the children of Israel's journey through the wilderness is like our journey through life. They had choices to make and God didn't force them. But God did show them each time whenever they made wrong choices, what would happen. People died. People were ill. They saw the wrath of God. They only saw a small part of it. There's a lot more to come. They had the opportunity to turn their back on sin and the wrong way of life and to follow the right way. And God didn't force them to. Some chose, some didn't. And even Moses, as he struggled, um, and as he disobeyed God, had to pay a price for sin. I have no doubt that Moses is with God in heaven now. But he still had to pay that price. And that price was he didn't get to enter into the promised land. He was taken up into heaven before that. You know, and sometimes we forget that. Sometimes whenever we've done wrong, we think if we ask God for forgiveness, that, that's it. But there's, there's still a cost. There's still that sense of giving an account of ourselves. Uh, and again, the New Testament teaches that. Yes, judgment is set aside from us. So we're not judged in the way that we should be. So we're not excluded from God's presence. But yet we still have to give an account of ourselves. That's scary. That's frightening. Um, it's a sobering thought that in some shape or fashion that we will have to stand in front of God and answer for our actions. But we answer it. We answer for those actions with Jesus sitting at God's right hand, interceding for us or speaking on our behalf and saying, it's all right. My blood has washed away their sin. They have your grace, Father. They are your child. Wow. To think that Jesus does that for us. To think that he stands there and represents us. And stands between us and God and says, there's no wrath needed here. There's no anger needed here. There's no judgment required. They're covered by my blood. That's amazing. That should be the sobering thought. That should be a, an amazing thought for us. That should uplift us and bring us closer to God. But it should also challenge us that we should want to live our lives the way God wants us to. That we should want to live a sinless life as much as we can. We'll, we'll never achieve it this side of glory. We can't do it. We're, we're flawed. But that doesn't stop us from trying. That doesn't stop us from putting in the effort. And that's what it's about.
It doesn't stop us from helping and encouraging each other each day. Verse 13, you must warn each other each day while it is still the day. Let's encourage one another. Let's look out for one another. Let's be there for one another, especially at this time. You know, it's, it's really easy at this time to get down and downtrodden, to get sucked into things that you shouldn't be sucked into. But, you know, have we got somebody who says to us, how are you doing? Does somebody say that to us? Or do we say it to anybody else? How are you doing? Really, how are you doing? How are you getting on? Maybe this week, you can think about somebody who maybe you haven't spoken to them for a while. Maybe it's a friend. And you can say to them, how are you getting on? What challenges do you face? How can I pray for you? Do you encourage you? And then in return, think of yourself. And think about how you're living and really examine it and ask God to help you in those areas where you know you're falling down. Let's pray together. Father, thank you again for your grace, for your provision, for your son. Lord, help us to be able to look out for one another, to encourage one another and challenge one another. But then, Lord, help us to, to turn the, the focus upon ourselves and to examine our own lives and, Lord, to re- surrender unto you those areas which we know are not right and ask that you would take control of those areas of our life and change and transform them for your glory and for your honour. Lord, thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks, folks, for joining with me this evening. Um, We'll be back again, same time, same place next week, next Wednesday at half seven. Till then, take care and God bless. Bye.